Welcome, everyone. Whoop. Welcome to our Sound for Video session. My got a signal chain. It's a little bit different today. <laughs> Thanks to everyone for joining. It is the 31st of May, 2020, and uh, we've got a new Sound for Video session this week and wanted to kind of just run through the signal chain here really, for, really quickly first, as we typically do. So tonight I'm using the Earthworks SR314. It's going to be a little bit more roomy than the SM7B typically would be, but... Um, Overall, I think it's a pretty decent. I think it's a pretty decent fit for my voice. Not perfect, but not bad either. And then we have this running into something very different this week. In fact, we're running into an Allen and Heath SQ5 digital mixer. So this is not something we typically use uh, for the sound for video session, but this is the mixer that I own, and uh, this is going to be this is going to play a part in our session just a little bit later today. And then from there, of course, it's going into my Canon C200 camera, out to the A8, A10 Mini Pro, and then that's being uh, sent out onto the internet here to YouTube. So that is the signal chain we're running with here today. Just a quick um, sound check. Everything is, is everything coming out through okay? We're not clipping or anything. Levels seem all right. And uh, thanks, thanks, Vincent, for the super chat. Thanks so much for that. All right, coming through loud and clear, and Alejandro says, amazing sound, sounds good. Okay, well, let's jump in. Let's take a look at a couple things here. Um, whoops, let me switch over here to, boy, there, let me get that right, okay. <laughs> uh, we're gonna talk through our agenda here really quickly. First of all, AES Virtual Vienna. I wanna talk about that for just a minute. For those that are not familiar with AES, AES is the, um, is a is something that you should know about and it is the let me just pull i got something here i want to pull up for you there it is okay good there we go okay aes is the association for um oh good grief what is it now <laughs> oh audio engineering wow well, well, shoot what does it stand for aes i i'm a new member actually <laughs> And um, let's just go to their to their main site here, aes.org. Audio Engineering Society. Just kind of got stuck there for a minute. They are actually doing, um, if you're not a member, uh, it, just a little bit about the association. It is, uh, or society, it is made up of professional audio engineers uh, from lots of different do domains. And um, I don't know that production sound mixers some of them are involved, not all of them, but um, anyway, it they they do put on conventions from time to time, and normally they're in person, of course. They usually put one on in New York. They have one in Europe. Um, typically, I don't know where it's usually located in Europe, but this year, of course, they're doing a virtual one. Well, uh, it's, it's usually in Vienna. <laughs> Duh. Um, but they're putting on a virtual one, and so for members, that's for members only, I believe, or you, you can... I don't know all the details, but if you are interested, they put on a variety of, um, they have a variety of talks that are actually looking pretty interesting. So here, for example, perceptually motivated filter design with applications to loudspeaker and room equalization, transform processing of audio, audio signal processing in the real world, dealing with the effects of finite precision. Lots of really kind of what looked to me like pretty fascinating sessions. And it goes, it spans, I think, three days. Um, they have some for students as well, but just something I wanted you to be aware of. I'm not necessarily saying, you know, you should all join the AES and, and go to the show, but, but it may be something worth considering. It looks like it's much more academic, a little bit more academic, um, but it does look pretty fascinating. And, um, it, I do have work, so I'm not going to be able to go to all the sessions, of course, but I am hoping to maybe attend some of them. So just wanted you to be aware of that that is something to consider at some point. All right, um, course updates. Just a quick update for those that were not aware, we did release our Zoom F6 course. So if you were waiting for that, that's available now over on at school.learnlightandsound.com. And also we are in the process of updating the Fairlight Fundamentals course. So um, that was a course we released last year. Um, we built it originally on version 15 of Fairlight in DaVinci Resolve. And we're in the process now of updating that to 16.2.2. There are a few changes that were made in Fairlight. And, you know, 
we've we've updated just one segment so far to kind of correct where the settings are in the preference or the or what is it the project settings I think is where you're going to find some some of the things have moved around a little bit and anyone that's already in that course you'll get the updates as well so we'll also have some new segments there that cover well a couple things number one we're going to have a better example uh, in terms of a mix. <laughs> Um, what we had before was an interview with my daughter and I, and that was a little confusing from the standpoint that you'd hear my voice instructing, and then you'd hear my voice in the interview. And sometimes it was hard to differentiate the two. So we're going to do an interview that doesn't include me, which is a better move, I think. And that was based on some feedback. Um, I kind of knew that intuitively, but I didn't have time. Anyway, I'm not going to make excuses, but we're going to update that. So that'll be coming here in the near future. All right. Let's go ahead and jump into the question and answer. And then we have a little exercise for everybody a little later on. It's a pop quiz, if you will. Don't worry. Um, it's not anything that uh, will create any problems for anybody. You're not going to be graded. <laughs> but uh, I do want to run through a couple of things. First up, a uh, question from Shadox. Uh, I have a question for a recording of a live event. There are no instruments to record on stage. It's pop music with just instrumental music and voices to record. So I assume that means you know, electronic instruments or pre-recorded music. Um, I have two recorders, the Tascam DR-05X and the Zoom H5, and a pair of two Octava MK012s with a pair of three capsules, omnidirectional, cardioid, and hypercardioid. And the question that Shadox has is, where should we put the mics and recorders? I thought about putting one in front of the PA. I, I assume what you mean by that is in front of the, um, at the mixing board or the mixing console. And... To, and that is, of course, to get the mix heard by the sound technician, but where to install the other ones. Also, I need to record the public. Which polar pattern should I use on the Octava mics, and where should I put them? And let me, he sent in some pictures, he or she sent in some pictures of the venue. It looks really cool, actually. Um, so what you're seeing here is this is the view from the stage. So if I were standing on stage looking out, you can see there's a balcony, and then there's the main floor down in front of the stage. And here's a side view, so the stage to the right. And then you can see the balcony up above. Kind of, it's a, it's not a huge venue, but it looks really, it's really well done from a visual standpoint, at least. Um, hopefully from an acoustic standpoint as well. This is a view from up on the balcony off to one side. And then here is a map of things. And it looks like um, up on the balcony, at the back of the balcony, we have the, where the uh, mixing board is and where the technicians will be. The front of house mixer, if you will. So... Um, I'm not sure what your, you know, what, what access you have to things here. And it looks like if we take a step back here, you can see, um, see that the speakers, see them suspended off in the distance there, just out, just above the stage. That's a line array and it's a variety of different speakers. And the idea with that kind of curvature there is that you can send the audio out and it can be heard, you know, cause you have various levels here and it's a fairly... It's a fairly small venue, it looks like. So you have to have that, you know, to get the sound working well up on the balcony and down on the floor. Um, a line array is really helpful. And that's actually a lot of venues are using those these days. So um, I don't know what your freedom is in terms of microphone placement. Like, do you have run of the place? Will they let you put it anywhere? Are you with the band? You know, I don't, I don't know. There are a lot of like contextual things that I don't really know. But yeah, I, I would agree. I would probably put my two... The octavas, I would connect up to the Zoom H5 and put somewhere near the uh, mixing board. That that would probably be my first choice. And then take the Tascam and put that down somewhere where you can get a good recording of the audience. Because it sounds, here's the thing is that in the past, I always thought, well, the ultimate would be get a feed from the board and the board would have the cleanest feed. But the problem with that is if you do take a, a mix from the board, they have applied usually some EQ to kind of tune the sound for that particular room that you're in. That may not sound good on a recording. And so you don't necessarily want to take a feed from the board. Now you can also get splitters, bringing all of the inputs in. Whoops, got jumped ahead there. Sorry about that. Um, you could get splitters and, and for each of the inputs coming into the board, get a feed of those, but then you need line isolators and other things. And you, it doesn't sound like you're really equipped for that. So I would just avoid that. I would just, I would probably set up the the two MK012s up near the mixing board, and I would probably put them in um, sort of an, o, uh, an ORTF stereo pair kind of configuration. So that would probably be my first choice if I were in this particular situation. 
And we don't have time to go into the, all the details on you know, that type of stereo recording necessarily, but that's a, just a, a placement where the two mics are placed, um, I don't know, I don't remember the exact distance, but there are some a little bit, maybe a little more than 12 inches apart, and they're each facing out um, at an angle. I guess you can't really see that. Yeah, I guess you can kind of see that on the little picture in picture here, but that's the main idea. Um, so that's what I would do there. And then I would go down below into the main hall to have the Tascam down there to capture the audience as well. So those would be my initial thoughts, but if you guys have additional input there for our friend, uh, definitely leave those up in the chat there. We'd love to hear your input as well. All right, next up from Richard. This is actually not a question, but <laughs> um, kind of an interesting insight here, or a recommendation actually. So no, no question or problem at the moment. You already saw my two big... Um, so he has a mix pre and he was trying to use it as an audio, or he is using it as an audio interface with Logic Pro 10. And he was having trouble getting the inputs routed correctly. And so we walked him through the, the setup of the, um, in the output menu, um, going to the, the USB one through six and just kind of got that cleaned up. Everything was working. And so he's making a recommendation here that we should add a segment along these lines to the course. And that's, I think, a good idea. So we'll go ahead and put that on the list of things to do. So thank you for that, Richard. Next up from Kevin J. I'm looking at getting the ATEM Mini Pro. And I'm wondering if you can show how you can use the ATEM with an external audio recorder like the Mix Pre 6. Also, if you could show some of the things you can do with the ATEM and the camera controls with the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. Any other tips or tricks you can think of related to the ATEM Mini Pro? Also, are there any accessories or attachments that might be helpful or useful? Yes, I definitely have a few thoughts on that. So, Kevin, first thing... Uh, I did do a video a couple of weeks ago where we did a demonstration of how to set up one way to set up the um, the audio processing. So um, you can that that's a video you'll find over on my main channel, Curtis Judd. So take a look for that. I think that's will hopefully be very helpful for you. The second thing that I would say is that, <clears throat> excuse me, I generally route the audio through my camera. You, you may have heard as we talked about the signal chain we're using here tonight. I generally route the audio through the camera. Now you don't have to do that, but that's the way I generally do it. And then that way you don't have to worry about the audio being in sync with the video because the camera takes care of that for you. The problem with the A10 Mini Pro's inputs is that you don't have any facilitate facilities on the A10 Mini Pro itself to get the audio in sync with the video because what happens is audio comes out much faster than video does, especially, well, in the case of the A10 Mini Pro, it has HDMI input, so you're always going to be using HDMI. And um, HDMI almost always has a fair bit of latency. So you're typically going to be off... I've, I've heard of people talking about being off by 10 frames of video, which is significant. You can definitely notice that. So what I, from that standpoint, I usually feed the audio from the Mix Pre or whatever I'm using into the camera, and then the camera's HDMI takes the audio and video together in sync into the A10 Mini Pro, and that gets around those potential sync issues. So that's one, I think, major thing to consider. Now, if you, you can run the audio into the A10 Mini Pro if you're going to be using uh, an encoding app on your computer, so for example, OBS, then you can use OBS to offset the audio. It has a feature to do that. So that's another option if you want to do it that way. Um, I think the most important thing is setting level um, or calibrating the levels between your mix pre and your camera. Um, and if you are enrolled in the mix pre six core or the mix pre course, we have a segment in there that shows you exactly how to do that. You can use the tone on the mix pre to get the levels calibrated between your mix pre and your camera. So that would be something to check out there as well. Um, we also have some of those videos you can find on the channel here as well. So you can just do a search for Curtis Judd Audio, send audio to camera, and you'll be able to find some of those here as well if you're not enrolled in the Mix Pre course. What else can I tell you? Um, take it slow. If you're, as you're building up and doing a live stream show, I would not try to add everything at the same time. Or no, don't try to get too fancy all at once. Do it a step at a time. Just each you know, as your show goes on each week or however often you do it, do one or two little new things at a time. Don't do six or eight new things at once. <laughs> um, just so that you can help, you can you can work out or sort out any issues if you don't do run into issues. So um, 
Another thing that may be useful is document your process if you can. Uh, you know, that way, so if something gets out of whack and you're getting set up for a new uh, live stream and you're, you know, scratching your head trying to figure out, you can, you know, you can walk your way through the, the signal chain. Okay, my microphone is connected to the camera. We're getting a good level in the camera, you know, or, what, or to the mix pre or whatever it is you're doing. Um, just, just be smart about it. Doc, I would, I would recommend documenting. It just helps solidify it in your mind, if nothing else. But also, have a plan for how you're going to troubleshoot in case anything goes crazy. So, those are some thoughts. I can't think of any accessories. Um, you're going to need HDMI cables, obviously. Um, you'll also need a USB cable, and I, I can't remember. I don't think it comes with a USB cable, so you're going to need your own for that. Um, Oh, in terms of working with the cameras, I do not have a video on that, but uh, I did see a good one from Gerald Undone. So if you go to YouTube and do a search for Gerald Undone ATEM Mini Pro, um, he has a video where he, he kind of walks through that whole process of working with the Blackmagic Pocket cameras with the ATEM Mini Pro and controlling them from the ATEM software control. So I haven't done that. I actually don't stream with my Blackmagic Pocket cameras. <laughs> I know, crazy. Um, but I, I've been using the Canon C200 for a variety of reasons. I won't go into all of them here, but the main one is focus is really helpful. And it also has XLR inputs that I don't have to use an adapter cable for. They're qu it's quieter. Um, the fan actually turns off when you press record on it. So that's not true with the pocket cameras. Now, that, that's not, I'm not saying that's a problem. It's just in my particular setup here, it doesn't work really well. So... Um, Eric actually brings up an interesting point here as well. When I was talking about sync here, or ache, uh, talks about the mix pre has an option to delay the audio, the output audio, and that is true. So if I think you're working with the mix pre six, so I don't know that you have that same option, but the mix pre ten does have that option, which can be pretty helpful as well. All right. So Kevin, thanks for that question there. Sean has a question. I've been recording with the MKH 416 indoors a lot lately, and haven't noticed any problems with the sound. But in the event I run into phase issues, are there any tricks of the trade I can try? I love its sound and don't want to change microphones. I'm already using sound blankets where I can. I don't completely understand sci the science involved in the construction of a shotgun mic, but would covering the sides, uh, the slots on the side of the 416 help prevent these phase issues while still giving me that 416 sound? When I use my hands to cover the slots, I didn't notice effect affecting this, the sound that much but I haven't been able to test it with phase issues because I haven't encountered them. It just seems like covering the slots or some of them would make the microphone act more like an indoor dialogue at the expense of canceling out some reverb, but I'm just guessing. Um, Sean, actually, if you're not experiencing that problem uh, and you're using sound blankets, I wouldn't worry about it. Just use your 416 and, and keep recording. It's a pretty rare thing. It's usually when the sound comes directly in the side or kind of at an angle. Um, and if you've got the mic aimed right and you're using sound blankets to manage the reverb, don't, don't mess with it. I would, I would be wary of covering the interference tube slots, um, because the microphone is designed to work with those. So, um, I don't know if anyone else has experience actually blocking those to see what happens. I've never done it, but if you're not encountering the issue, don't worry about it. Just keep doing what you're doing. Um, I, I think the main thing you can do if you do run into those issues, A, make sure the microphone is aimed correctly, and B, make sure you're using sound blankets to manage reverb. Um, so other than that, I think keep doing what you're doing if it's working. So, all right. Um, John actually submitted something here, and uh, John said, Hope all is well with you. Since I can't really record people these days, I've taken making ambient recordings of nature. I've been recording a three... <clears throat> excuse me. 3DIO binaural microphone through a mix pre 10 and getting some lovely results. And I put the URL for his SoundCloud, um, the link there with that recording so you can all hear it. He did a good job, John. You did a nice job on that. And in fact, what I wanted to do here is I just want to, um, for those that are not familiar with that microphone, I just wanted to pull it up here. It's a pretty interesting, and it, it almost looks, it's kind of funny when you first see it. You're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> Um, it's a binaural microphone that looks like this. Um, and I, I don't know if this is the particular one you're using, John, but um, this is the one I've seen before. Uh, and you can see there are two XLR outputs here. Those run into your recorder. This is obviously made to look and operate 
and capture sound very much like a human hearing system would capture sound. So it's a pretty interesting thing. So definitely go have a listen to John's uh, recording. I think it was really good. Beautiful, soft, relaxing rain and kind of distant thunder as well. So worth checking out. So thanks, John, for sending that over. Appreciate that. All right. And then finally, Mikey says, can you talk about cables, specifically XLR, in tonight's session? Importance of brand, quality issues, do's and don'ts, etc." Yes, um, can. Let me just say, um, before I forget here, Rob, thank you for the super chat, for the coffee fund. Thank you. <laughs> and then also cream and sugar from Rob's coffee fund. Thanks so much, guys. Um, over here to Mike's question. Cables are interesting. So I think the interesting thing about cables is that, you know, some people are asking, actually, let me just switch out of this here. People, I keep bumping that with my, I've got a funky setup here because I've got the mixer on the desk tonight. <laughs> so I keep bumping that. I apologize. Um, uh, cables, I, I have not noticed a substantial difference in terms of audio quality with different XLR cables. However, what I have noticed is their ability to reject interference, either um, electromagnetic or radio frequency. Um, and that's usually when they're shielded more, with their, the higher quality cables are, are better shielded and they have more immunity to electromagnetic and radio frequency interference. So that's where using uh, higher quality cables can definitely pay off. Now, are you gonna hear a substantial difference in the, the quality of the recorded audio? Generally not. I, I haven't found that generally to be the case. So um, it's more in my, in my experience about those things, about being able to reject uh, potential interference and just overall reliability is another thing. So the um, someone just brought this up actually, Rod, thanks for bringing that up. I'm glad you did. Somebody did a, my friend actually, Bandrew over at Podcastage. If you've not, if you're not subscribed to his channel, you might check it out. Podcastage did a video on XLR cables last week where he actually tested them and uh, kind of demonstrates basically what I've just said here, that you're not going to notice necessarily a huge, huge difference um, in terms of recording with microphones with different quality cables, but you could potentially notice a difference in radio frequency, electromagnetic frequency, interference, and those kind of things, and reliability. But uh, on top of that, Vincent does bring up a good point. When you're talking about high impedance devices like guitars or other instruments, that's where you can see a different with difference with different types of cables. I'm talking in the context of balanced microphones. That's where you're not necessarily going to notice a huge difference in terms of audio quality. So, Mike, thanks for that question. I hope that was helpful. So, I would I would just keep in um, keep that in mind. It's in terms of brands. Um, what I actually, I, by the way, I did uh, make my first cable. You're hearing it right now. We're using it tonight here. I have actually. Let me just pull this up a little bit. Hopefully not making any noise. Uh, invested in a new microphone boom arm here. This is from a company called Yellow Tech. And um, it's very expensive. <laughs> and, uh, it's a lot of, it's, I think they really kind of served the broadcast market. So it was a, like a 600 or some dollar thing. And, and the reason I did it is because I use it every week. So, and I, and I use it for my courses as well. So it was a business investment, but um, it came with the cable already run internally. And I had to, uh, terminate the ends using these um, connectors. So uh, in terms of brand, what I have found is that the higher quality um, brands, which provide more shielding, and they're different grades from each of these companies, but the companies that I typically are use, I'm using is Mogami, makes some high quality cabling. Canari makes some good quality cabling. There are probably some others as well. Um, those are the two I'm most familiar with and that I've used the most. Um, I use typically, I'm looking for Neutrik connectors and those generally work the best. Now they have some with silver conductors and some with gold conductors. And I, <laughs> I don't know how much of a difference that makes. Um, but in any case, I soldered these on. And so now I actually have my own soldering station and probably will be making some of my own cables in the future. Up until now, I went to my local pro audio shop called Performance Audio and they would make cables for me. And you could choose which kind of cabling you wanted, whether you wanted Mogami, Canari, and they have different, they have like a quad 
There's a quad core, I think it's called, from Canary, which is really, really well shielded. A lot of the production sound mixers will use those cables. So those are the kind of things to look for. Again, Neutrik connectors, Mogami Canary, there may be some others as well. So um, yeah, in fact, uh, let's see here. It looks like Rod was uh, typing those out for us. So thank you for that. And then one thing that Vincent says as well, inductance and capacitance and such can make a difference on certain devices, but otherwise Mogami and the like are just peachy keen. So what? No love for Amazon Basics XLR cables? Well, <laughs> Rob, uh, we actually have a story about that, don't we? Um, our friend, the basic filmmaker, went and bought years ago. Well, I don't know how long ago he bought these. I can't remember. He tweeted about this recently. He bought some Amazon Basics XLR cables and was tearing his hair out trying to figure out why he was getting this low-level buzz in some of his audio uh, stuff. So um, he had, a, in his particular case, he was probably getting some electromagnetic interference because he was running them all, I assume, along with a bunch of power cables as well. That's another thing. If you don't run them, never, if you can avoid it, don't run your microphone cables parallel with power cables. Run them perpendicular uh, instead of parallel. And that will help in some cases. So uh, you know, and then some people say here, well, let's see, let's see, let's see what Vincent says. Very sensitive, expensive test equipment might tell the difference on gold or silver, but we never will. Good point. Um, Vincent uses Amazon Basics at home, and Rod said that he also started out on Amazon Basics. So just be careful with those. Those are, I mean, yeah, the audio quality will be fine until it's not. <laughs> and then you've got a problem. When you start getting that interference, that's when you've got a problem. So Anyway, some um, some input for you there. All right, <clears throat> we're at eight thirty my time, so halfway in here. I wanted to I wanted to do try a little something, try a little something different here. Um, my my take is that the best way to learn is to practice, and so we're gonna have a little exercise here using our mixer, and so tonight we're using a, an SQ five from Allen and Heath. This is a digital mixer, typically used for live sound reinforcement, but you can use it for recording as well. Uh, so we're getting a little bit of glare on screen, but it, we're going to do our best here. So what I've got is I've got just a single microphone in here. It's kind of funny. This is like a 32 uh, input mixer, but we're just using one. <laughs> Actually, we're using two. The music played through uh, another channel over here. So you see I've got banks. Um, and actually, I've got more than, I think maybe it's, is it 48? I can't remember how many inputs it is. But in any case, uh, we're coming here on channel number one. And what I wanted to do is have you guys uh, kind of get a setup here. I want you to, I want you to, I'm going to turn every, all the processing off that I have set up here. So I've got right now a high pass filter, a compressor. Um, oh yeah, and I have some EQ as well. Um, so let's go ahead and turn all that off, and I want to kind of challenge you guys to, to kind of fine-tune those settings and tell me what works best on my voice. So let's go ahead and do this. So you may have to adjust your volume here. I'm going to go ahead and turn the compressor off. I'm going to turn the high-pass filter off and the EQ off. And it looks like the levels dropped just maybe just a touch. But first here, um, you can see I've got the preamp coming in, and this is a... The meter here is a meter that uh, we're coming in about 0 dBV. So that's a dBV meter as opposed to a dB full scale meter. And let's take a look at our other settings here. So we've got, first of all, a high pass filter. So I'm going to go ahead and set this one here. <laughs> you guys tell me um, when it sounds good. So. I've got it set right now to 52.3 hertz. If I come up here, you'll notice, and let me just do a pre-fader listen for myself, for my own benefit here. If I come up, I'm, I'm pushing it. Um, right now we've got it at 400 and, wait a minute. There we go. I don't know if you can hear that, if it's starting to sound thinner. No pain, no gain. <laughs> Thanks, Vincent. 
Uh, so we, we already set our gain, so I think we're gonna we're pretty good there. Um, in any case, uh, does this this should sound a lot thinner as I pull it up here. And for reasons I don't understand, I'm not getting the uh, the prefader isn't really. Let me try that. Checking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It doesn't sound like it's affecting a lot. I'm not getting my prefader, but I normally will set this somewhere around 50 hertz. Now, why do we do this? Why do we put a high pass filter on? For a spoken word, and actually this is gonna apply for music in most cases as well, the idea here is that this low frequency content is not something that's typically in most voices. So maybe men's voices can start to reach down into the 80 hertz range. Maybe some people, um, some people maybe more, but in any case, um, usually rolling that off is gonna make it better for people's playback systems. So their playback systems aren't gonna struggle because if they're trying to reproduce stuff down into these low frequencies and they're not really capable of it and trying to reproduce everything else, this is the thinking, in my mind at least, um, that you just wanna get rid of that. It's just gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna show up in some people's playback. It's not gonna show up in others depending on what they're listening back on. Just get rid of it. It's not important to what we're doing anyway. So that's the first thought. Next up, we do have a gate here. And let me just show the gate. Um, there we go. So let me put a really extreme setting on here and you tell me uh, what happens. So what I'm gonna do here, we're gonna turn the gate on and I'm going to set the threshold. Actually, first let me set the depth and let me go really extreme. Okay, so let me set the threshold now. No, notice when I stop talking, it drops it by 44 decibels. How does that sound? Curious what your thoughts are. So I'm using unrealistic settings here. <laughs> Um, but and the reason I'm doing that is just to show when does this gate engage. And so first what we want to do is I set a really extreme depth setting. So this is how much attenuation it's going to do when the gate kicks in. But now we have to tell the gate when to kick in. When the levels fall below this threshold, that's when it kicks in. So I can adjust this. So if I could bring it up here to minus 17, it kicks in pretty quickly. And then if I drop it down, notice here, if I drop it down to maybe 48, it never even kicks in. I bring it up to 45. You can see this red line here. That means it's kicking in. So if I were gonna use it, I'd probably put it somewhere around here, 37. And you're just going to tweak it until it's, you see it come in when it's, it, you know, obviously it needs to turn off when I'm talking. And when I stop talking, it needs to turn on. Now, that's, now we're going to change this depth setting because <laughs> that's a crazy setting. And the reason I say it's crazy is it sounds completely and utterly unnatural. So what I want is if I'm, this is not going to be such something that I would typically use if it's just me. But if I have two people or three people, and I don't have an auto mix feature, and actually this, this does have an auto mix feature, but if I didn't have an auto mix feature and I was kind of using this in lieu of that, and I just wanted to attenuate a little bit, I'd probably do something more like 6 dB. And let's see how that sounds here. So as I go ahead and I've set the depth now to 6 dB, the threshold is thir minus 37. So when I stop talking, it reduces the noise floor a little bit, but not so unnaturally as when it was set to minus 40. So there's just utter silence. It sounds like I've kind of packed it up and went home. So that's that's kind of my approach to using a gate if I'm going to use a gate. Um, but to be honest, I don't use them a whole lot. <laughs> uh, but it is something that, so if you want to kind of manage room noise in between phrases, it's not gonna do anything for while you're talking, but when you're not talking, it'll help manage any sort of room tone. Little example again. And in fact, um, Vince uh, Rob actually says, 
Uh, Curtis, does your mixer have an expander? Can you show us its impact? So this basically is an expander. Um, a gate is actually just an extreme form of, of an expander, but that's exactly what this is doing. So as soon as we hit, as soon as our audio goes below minus 37, that threshold, it's expanding the noise floor downward by 6 dB. So this, Rob, is exactly what we're talking about. This is an expander. You can also see here that when I stop talking, it's doing a gain reject reduction. So that little LED comes on right there. All right. Um, for now, I'm going to turn that off because we're going to we're going to work on a compressor next. And this is where I need your help. Okay. So we're in the compressor now. Oops, there it is right there. Um, okay. Now we have a, a variety of different settings here. So this is where the volume is going to fluctuate some. So I apologize in advance. Be ready on your volume controls. <laughs> and hopefully this won't be a painful experience here. So, um, all right. So we have a few settings here. Um, first of all, we have our ratio. Right now it's set to two to one. So that's how much it's going to compress. So once we go over that threshold, it's going to compress by that much. So every 2 dB we go over the threshold, it's going to compress that down. So it's just 1 dB over the threshold. Let's think of it in those terms. Um, okay. We have up on the top here our attack and release. We have over here our threshold. And here we have our makeup gain. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the makeup gain off for now. Okay. Let's talk about attack and release. So attack refers to how long it takes for the compressor once it crosses the threshold to get to its full ratio. It doesn't, it's not like a pause and wait for this long. It's about how long does it take to get fully to that ratio of two to one compression. So that's what the attack is about. Release is just the inverse of that. How long does it take for it to go from the full compression once the audio drops below the threshold back to uh, a non-compressed state? So that's what these two do right here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then here's the thing. Uh, good point, Vincent. <laughs> Compressors are incredibly abused on a lot of YouTubers out there, and I agree. Um, it's an art. Learning how to use a compressor is a bit of an art. So let's go ahead and, and uh, let's get input from those that are more experienced out there. What would you suggest that we use as a threshold here or an attack here? Excuse me. So as an attack, um, typically the thinking is that you want to use something that's going to sound a bit more natural. So you need to be able to, well, let me take a step back. Whole idea with a compressor in the case of spoken word dialogue is really to manage the waveform. So you get those, those extreme peaks. You want to probably generally pull those down a little bit, kind of overall even out the overall level in terms of amplitude of the waveform. And that way you can push everything up so it's a little bit louder. And that's the idea of certainly here with live, live streaming, for example. So the idea with an attack is that to keep it sounding fairly natural, you don't necessarily want to go with a super fast attack. Now we can go all the way down here um, to very, very fast. So it kicks in very, very quickly. It's very aggressive. Or we can pop out here into the milliseconds range. And that, then it kicks in, it takes it longer for the compressor um, to really kind of ramp up to its full ratio. And you can see here the red line is showing how much gain reduction it's doing. So how much it's compressing right now. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and assume that's good. Um, let's leave it at 250 for now. The next thing to set is the threshold. Now the threshold, you can see if I move this threshold up, it's not going to compress as much. You can see it's basically not hitting the compressor now. If I pull it down, now you can see it's definitely pulling the compressor. It's, it's doing gain reduction on almost every single syllable here. As I pull down more and more, and you hear how that sounds now? We set our threshold to minus 20, and it's starting to, starting to sound a little bit strange, and it actually... Um, yeah, too extreme. So let's pull that back up. Okay, talking here. So generally what I'm looking for is I'm going to 
try and kind of tickle that gain reduction a little bit as I'm setting it here for spoken word for a live stream kind of scenario. So here we're at about minus, here is at minus 10. And you can see, it, again, it's kind of just tickling it there. And that's doing a pretty good job. So you can see as I talk a little bit louder, a little bit louder, it's going to compress a little bit more. And then as I talk softer, it's not going to compress quite as much. Now what I can do is I can apply what is called makeup gain. So now that we've managed those peaks, you can see here, we're generally on the um, dBV meter here. We're still, we're not hitting zero. We're, we're just under zero. I can apply a little bit of makeup gain. And so this will make my output level overall a little bit stronger. I probably want to go somewhere, I usually find five or six dB. You don't generally, I mean, you can go higher, higher than that, but I'm finding in a lot of cases that's going to be pretty good for where I want to be. Here's some uh, some interesting input here. So we've got from air traffic media, 2.5 to 1 ratio. Usually aim for an average of minus 2 to minus 3 dB with peaks at minus 6 dB reduction. So that seems, that seems good. Uh, sounds a bit crunchy. So I don't know when that came in, if you're saying it sounds crunchy now or if it was sounding crunchy before. <laughs> Not sure, but it is sounding probably a little bit crunchy right now, to be honest. Um, so, let's try that there. Checking 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And Vincent says, uh, predicting the, f uh, oh, here, let's get the first part of Vincent, or uh, Rob's. What is frustrating about compression while streaming is that between YouTube and a service like StreamYard, who both apply compression, the streamer has had a hard time predicting the final result. I feel like I'm playing whack-a-mole with my mixer at home. I I understand that. <laughs> Definitely understand that. So the thing is, is that if you rely on YouTube or StreamYard or some other service to do the compression, um, well, it's certainly not going to take care of any clipping for you. So there's that. And that's why I think it's important to do at least a little bit on your side. But um, yeah, I do understand the frustration. So anyway, there, yeah, there is a lot of fun involved in trying to figure out what in the world YouTube is doing. So uh, hang in there. And <laughs> I think what's important to do as well is to kind of review your live stream after the fact. So if you, you know, if you've got some settings that you dialed in and you're, you're monitoring on your end and it's sounding pretty good and your monitoring is far better as close to the end of the, the signal chain as you possibly can. Um, you should be getting close to what's being sent to YouTube. And then you'll probably have to listen to that back after the fact, um, just to see what YouTube did to it after that. So sometimes I'm surprised. Um, it seems if you send it good stuff, it doesn't need to do as much compression, and so it won't. And it won't mess around with the loudness as much if you send it a good, strong, loud signal from the start. So anyway, there are some thoughts there. Next, um, let's do some EQ. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead, yeah, let's do some EQ here. Okay, so I'm gonna come here and let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and zero things out here. That's the low mids, high mids, high frequency, okay. Now this mixer is pretty nice from the standpoint that you get a real-time analyzer. I don't know if you can see that. We're getting a little bit of glare on the screen here, but it's giving me a real-time view of the frequencies, what's happening. So this is really helpful when I'm doing equalization because I can actually rely on that to help me find the, the potentially problematic frequencies. So let's do this here. Let's go to the low mids first. And what I'm gonna do is go ahead and boost that up now you should start to, it should start to sound really weird. And let's go somewhere around eight or nine dB. I'm gonna tighten up the width so that we're looking at a, a fairly narrow part of the spectrum. And let me go ahead and sweep this back and forth. And you, what we're looking for here are any sort of strange resonances. So starting to hear something really, really weird. And I'm hearing a little bit of something there. Can you hear this? 
Here I am at almost 400 hertz. Hear how it's sounding kind of, I don't know what, how you would describe that, honky, <laughs> maybe? <laughs> There's a potential resonance there. Uh, let's go ahead and keep sweeping up while I talk, checking 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So let's keep down in this area here. But I think somewhere right around... Am I, gra am I crazy or are you hearing something here? I think I'm hearing something there. So let's go ahead and try this. Let's go ahead and pull the gain down. And we don't need to do a lot. Maybe... Let's do 3 or 4 dB. About 3 dB. We can maybe widen that up a little bit. All right, so here we have our first cut. So typically the, the approach is, from my standpoint, that when you're, when you're trying to sweeten something, you're typically going to be doing cuts. Um, hardly ever boosts. Almost always finding weird resonant frequencies and pulling them down a little bit. So let's try another one here. Let's go to our high mids here. And let's bump that up. There's 9 dB. Narrow it up so we can kind of pinpoint where we want to go. Whoops, there we are. All right, let's sweep. Okay, we're hearing something that sounds a little bit, ooh, something weird there. Is it just me or are you hearing that too? Daniel said we did find something there at 400 for sure. Here's uh, something at 1K that I'm hearing. There might be something here at 2K as well. There's some harshness right there in my voice. So let's try, let's try cutting that one there, see what we get. Pull that down 4 dB. Let's see, we can widen that a bit. Let's go back to the low mid and widen that some more too. All right, check, check, one, two, three. So the idea here is that my voice should start now to sound a little smoother as we, as we try to get those, um, try to get those kind of, those, the harsh resonances taken care of in my voice and kind of pull those back a little bit, so. All right, we do have some S's. And so we're gonna go into the high frequency here. We don't, I don't believe we have a de on this mixer. So let's just use some EQ. So let's go ahead and bump this up. Not quite so much. <laughs> Somewhere in there. Narrow it up. Okay, so I'm gonna start saying the letter S a lot. She sells seashells by the seashore. And I apologize in advance if this is a really brutal thing. She sells seashells by the seashore. 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 What we're looking for here is the frequency that kind of sounds the most brutal when I say the letter S, checking. She sells seashells by the seashore. She sells seashells by the seashore. And she sells seashells by the seashore. I think it's somewhere in there. So let's try pulling that down a bit. And we'll widen that up just a touch too. All right, she sells seashells by the seashore. Now, the, th the thing with S's and sibilants is that you don't want to go too crazy on it. If you go too crazy, it will start to sound like the person has a lisp, and you don't necessarily want a lisp either. <laughs> um, and actually, I don't feel like we got that. I'm going to go back up again. She sells seashells. Ooh, maybe we did. She sells seashells. Where do you guys vote? Go ahead and vote in the chat here. She sells seashells by the seashore. That's at um, about six kilohertz. She sells seashells by the seashore. And let's bump it up here to nine, just over nine kilohertz. She sells seashells by the seashore. Could, it's just kind of this whole range here on my voice. All right, we're gonna do a four dB cut. She sells seashells by the seashore. You tell me, does that sound like an improvement? Rob is thinking that the S's are a little bit closer to 5K. Harsh. <laughs> yes, harsh indeed. Sorry about that. 
Um, so we ended up on 6.95K with a fairly wide cut of about 4 dB in the high frequencies there. And I think she sells seashells by the seashore. That seems, in my ears at least, seems to have mellowed it out a bit. Curious what your thoughts are there in the uh, chat. Better at 9 kilohertz. Interesting. Okay. Um, so let's bump that up a little bit. She sells seashells by the seashore. She sells seashells by the seashore versus, that was 9 kilohertz. Let's go back down to 6. She sells seashells by the seashore. Almost sounds to me like it's cutting more when I move down to 6. Um, but it is it is all very subjective. And so um, when you talk about sibilance, it's actually a potentially a fairly large range. Um, you could just give yourself a comb filter, Ken says. <laughs> yeah, um, true. And then and, and indeed, I mean, we're basically combing right here. I mean, I mean, uh, we definitely are doing a fair bit here. Okay. So in any case, that's a, that's a little run through. Um, and what I would recommend is if you, if this is all new to you, now obviously some of you guys have done plenty of this type of work before, but for those of you that haven't, if you want to get good at this, the best way to do that is to start practicing it. Um, and what I mean by that is it's best if you can, you can do it on your own voice. So make a recording and then bring the recording into your digital audio workstation, pull out your parametric EQ and start doing stuff like this. Train your ears. Now, after you've been working on it for about 15, 20, 30 minutes, your brain is going to start doing interesting things. You're going to, you're not going to, you may not be able to hear as well. So, um, actually one, one moment here, we're going to come back to this. Um, but I want to, I want to go back to Ken's, we're going to come back to what Ken said here in just a minute. Um, but yeah, you'd have to practice this. And if after, a, you know, after a while, you just feel like, oh, I can't tell if this is better or not, it's time to kind of take a break. So maybe step away for a while, go do something else um, where you're not listening to your computer and your own re the recordings you were working on. And uh, just, just give yourself some time and kind of reset your hearing and come back and work on it again. Or, for example, if you've done a mix or you've done, you know, some processing of some audio, step away for 15 minutes, come back, listen to it again. You might be astonished at how it sounds. You might think, oh my gosh, how did I possibly think that sounded good? <laughs> I've had it happen a bunch of times to me. So let's come back to what Ken was saying here. Try a wider EQ or a shelf. So we do have the opportunity to use a shelf. Now that's going to be a little extreme there. Um, let's see. I don't know if I, if I use a shelf, I have to be careful here. So I think the shelf is a little extreme here. Um, but let's try a wider, try this down, 4 dB, 5 dB, and you can, you can change the width here. So checking one, two, three, she sells seashells by the seashore, and I could go down even more. Here's minus 6 dB, she sells seashells by the seashore. Now if I go crazy, she sells seashells by the seashore, she sells seashells, I'm going to start getting some craziness there. Um, so we don't want to go that extreme, but she sells seashells by the seashore. Okay, so there's a quick look at how to kind of sweeten your voice potentially for live streams or any sort of live re sound reinforcement, um, or even how to do it in post. This applies even in your, if you're working in post. Same principles apply uh, in terms of what you can accomplish with a compressor, a gate, an EQ, high pass filter, so on and so forth. And so there are just some amazing things that some mixers are able to do just with those different tools, those, those fairly simple and straightforward tools when it comes to mixing. So hopefully that was helpful. Thank you also, Ken, for that. Um, definitely close. And actually here, here's a great one, Air Traffic Media said, let's go back and just take a look. 6.5K to 9K minus 6 dB. We ended up at minus 3.4. We could go a little bit more. And I landed, if I go to 7.65, got a fairly wide Q here. That's going to be pretty close to what you're hearing there, air traffic media. So she sells seashells by the seashore. She sells seashells by the seashore. 
All right. Well, let's uh, let's see here. We have just a couple minutes here. Let me just go through the comments here or the chat here real quick and just see if we've got anything else here that people are interested in talking about. I think I saw a question early on and want to see, just make sure I didn't miss anything here. Okay. Daniel is considering a C300 Mark III. Ooh. Fancy camera. Uh, sounds like a fun one. <laughs> you can do a lot with that camera. The thing with the Canon C series of... Um, the thing that I like about them is the preamps are not bad. The line You can change the line inputs and the, at least the C200. I don't know if the C100 or you know the earlier generations of the cinema cameras had AES input, but they do have AES input as well. So... Um, you can actually send a digital signal. So you can do all of the processing of your audio, the conversion to digital, and send it directly to your camera already in digital format. So you're basically bypassing the camera's preamps and converters altogether. That's a cool thing about those. And I believe the C300 Mark II has that as well. Don't know if the earlier versions do. But uh, one thing that's cool about that. Okay. <clears throat> Glenn said I was at first sounding a little bit hot and may have needed some high pass filter there. We've got it now. Thank you, Vincent, for it was, yes, Audio Engineering Society. <laughs> Same with Andre. Uh, EBU is European Broadcast Union. Across the pond from me here. Okay, let's see here. And do, I do hope everyone's doing well here, staying safe. Uh, Symbian says, just got the Octava MK012 Zoom F6 A10 Mini Pro. Getting noise when connecting to the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. I enrolled in your Zoom F6 course, but still not able to get clean audio into the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. Yes. Um, so one thing to consider there, Sembian, is on the Zoom F6, there is a known issue. I've actually contacted Zoom about this. If you are trying to send a mic level signal from the Zoom F6 into a microphone input on a camera, it's a noisy mess coming out of the Zoom F6. And so that's a known issue. <clears throat> what I would do in the case of the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera is change the 3.5 millimeter input to line level and then send a line level signal out of your Zoom F6. I got good results with that. So that's what I would do in your particular case if you haven't already tried that. If you have, maybe we need to talk some more, but in my testing, that's what I was able to do. So what that means is if you follow the course, the Zoom F6 course, um, the in that process, we're showing, uh, we're showing on a mic level input camera. And the problem with those cameras is you have, well, it's not a problem, but you have to bring the output fader way down so in your case, since you're setting line level, you shouldn't have to bring the output level or the, the line level fader down. Um, and so you should get a much cleaner signal. Hopefully that helps. Okay, Trevor says, that video for sending tone to camera came in handy. Used it this weekend to set up my Mix Pre 3 to my GH5, which is feeding through to the AT, uh, A10 Mini Pro. Yes, definitely a nice feature to have. And in fact, on, on the newer boards like this, um, we can also send a tone. In this case, we have it set up to one kilohertz minus 20, and that's how I set it up with my camera here. So I set up the, um, I was able to adjust the fader here to get the levels going just right. And you'll see that, you, you know, of course the Zoom F series has that. The uh, Mix Pre series has that, all of the pro level, um, field recorders basically have that type of uh, option. Okay. Uh, Semyon says, Octave is a stereo pair with hypercardioid and would love to get your guidance on input settings for the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. Uh, yeah, so if you're plugging that into the 6K, 
you have one XLR input. So you'll be using one microphone. And um, if you're going directly into camera, which I, I don't know if you're going into the Mix Pre first and then into camera, or sorry, the F6 first and then into camera. But um, if you're just going to go directly into camera, what I typically do, and the preamps are okay on that camera. Um, they're not amazing, but they're okay. And with a, with a microphone like the Octava MK012, you should be all right. But generally what I would do is you're going to have to turn on fan to power, of course. But then in terms of input level, I would get the mic boomed out over the person that's going to be talking and bring that input level up until it starts to peak around minus 12 dB to leave yourself some headroom there so that if things get really loud, laughs, so on and so forth, you, you won't clip. Um, but that's generally the approach I'm going to take. Maybe minus 18 um, for the peaks, between minus 18 and minus 12. And that's going to be your best bet there in terms of overall effect. Um, Eric is asking a question, is it the same as the delay input audio on the Mix Pre 6.2? No. There's a, an output delay on the Mix Pre 10 that does not, it is not a setting or an option on the Mix Pre 6.2. It's a hardware limitation on the Mix Pre 6 and 3, so it's not the same thing. The input delay is for wireless, digital wireless systems on the Mix Pre 3, 6, and 10 that you're talking about here, the input delay. Um, and that's just to get the, um, you'll, typically apply a delay on the wired microphones so that they come in a little bit later so that they'll be synced up with the digital wireless microphone systems because the digital wireless microphone systems have some latency. And uh, for example, a DD Connect has 19 milliseconds. Sennheiser AVX has 19 milliseconds. Um, some of the Rhodes, I think the Rode Filmmaker Kit has something like four milliseconds. So that one you may not need to offset necessarily. And um, I think the Rode Wireless Go has, you know, as an example, has something like, it's also a digital wireless system, um, somewhere in the 8 or 10 milliseconds of latency range. So, all right. Rod also has that 3 DIO and a Mix Pre 6. Awesome combination. I'm impressed with what that thing can capture. Really interesting. All right. Then we start talking about cables, and then we got into our little uh, demonstration here. Let's go back to the end here. Oh, here's Marcelo. Marcelo, can I assign the sound output from app software into the inputs of the Mix Pre 6? Um, let me make sure I understand. So the sound output from apps on running on your computer to the into... I think you mean inputs of the Mix Pre 6, and the answer to that is yes, you can do that. So if you go into your, I don't have it set up right now, but if you go into the channel menu for one of your inputs, and you can, on the second page, you can choose what you're getting an input from. The default is mic, you can also change it to line, but you can also choose it to change it to USB, one, two, three, or four usually. So yes, you can do that as well, Marcel, good question. Okay. Jared, have any thoughts or hands-on with Electrosonics D2 series? I wish I did, Jared. <laughs> I don't. Um, that's, I believe, Electrosonics new. Oh, we just lost the light back there. Time to charge. <laughs> um, I don't. I have talked with Carl Winkler from Electrosonics about them. Have not had an opportunity to use them. I He actually offered that he could lend me some stuff, so we may actually go and do that just so I can get some experience with that and talk a little bit more intelligently about it. But yeah, my understanding, that's a pretty nice, pretty nice system. Do you use the app on your phone or tablet? I am also wondering if the mixer has VCAs, DCAs, control groups, not sure what Alan and Heath calls them on this console. Um, they do, and they call them DCAs in this particular case. So they do have control groups. Um, I have used the app. I'm not using it right now, but yes, definitely. There's also, for those that are not aware on the, the mixer here, we do there is an app available as well. So you can see, let me just can pull that off there. So you can see at the bottom, you can see the DCA group uh, one through eight here. Just right down here at the bottom. 
Ähm, ja. Alright. Andre says, we sound better now than when we started the broadcast. So good. We got some better settings thanks to everybody's input. So <laughs> thanks for that. All right. Ken is asking, does the mixer have a built-in RTA? Here in the, um, there's a real-time analyzer here on the EQ page. So I don't know if you have one for, I think you have it for the output bus as well, or the for the mix. How exactly to get, I'm, I don't use this one a lot, to be honest. So uh, let's see here. The left, right mix. I don't know. I'd have to look at that to be honest. See what we'd get. So uh, let's go there and there. Here's the main output. Got a graphic EQ. Yeah, we do have an analyzer here on the left and right mix. So that'll give us our real time analyzer for the entire mix as well. Pretty cool. We've definitely got some options there. So, all right, everybody. Um, I think we covered everything that we had hoped to cover today. So thanks everyone for sending in your questions ahead of time and um, hope everyone's staying well out there. We are, we'll be back next week. I actually hopefully will have a special guest next week I think it's time for us to talk a little bit about recording for podcasts. And so we're working. We don't have a for sure yet, but if we're real lucky, we may be able to get a, a podcaster who has a lot of experience and has actually worked on some big podcasts to come uh, here with us next week. And if so, when I send the email out for next session, we'll go ahead and mention that. And so we'll, we'll kind of tailor the questions for podcasting next time. So in the meantime, everyone get out there, make some great sound, and we'll talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody.